It's Mountain Monday, and you know what to do. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out. So we're going to talk about bullying today. And part of this is because I've got an interview coming up this week. Yay, I've started collecting interviews again for you guys to watch. Uh, trying to keep them a little shorter now, but uh, the the topic of it is sexualization and bullying, and I want to focus on the bullying part because I had an experience over the weekend that I admit I'm still recovering from when someone tried to bully me, and it really made me realize um, how bullying the face of bullying has changed and i i came the the way i i deal with this stuff when i deal with stuff that i just find exhausting is to go and and read about some of the statistics of things and and you know i i discovered some pretty interesting insights about bullying and bullying dynamics we're not gonna have the time to get through them all today but i wanted to talk a little bit about how insidious it was because basically it was a situation of me saying i am not comfortable going forward this way it involved a format of something that i would have to deliver and i felt like it was too mean for for my liking i felt like it would unfairly put people on the spot that it was there was another way to do it that would allow people to keep their dignity better and the response in the private conversation was they knew what they were getting into and then an unwillingness to talk about the issue privately this individual who was the the the, the, you know, higher up than I was in this particular event, basically refused to have a conversation with it, forced, and, and you know, I was going into it. I, I didn't sleep the night before the event because the, the walk, the walkthrough for the event, because I was like, this guy's, and it, it happens to be a guy, don't assume I'm saying all men here. We'll get to those statistics in a minute because I think it's important, but it happened to be a guy in this case. I'm like, this guy is going to use social dynamics to try to coerce me into just going along to get along. Because that, that I find, is a very common tactic nowadays, that people, people in general do not want to rock the boat. They don't want to have an unpleasant conversation in front of uh, other people. And so what I find some you know, bullies or what is probably a better term for them is professional manipulators, manipulators in a professional setting. I found what many of these types try to do is they won't allow that private conversation where you can speak freely. They try to push when other people are around, assuming that you're going to back down so that you don't seem like, I mean, in my case, a bitch. And it got unpleasant. And the, you know, the guy above him did eventually get involved. Hello, phone. And was apologetic about it. It was one of these things that even though I stuck to my guns, even though I stood up, even though I essentially won the day, and yes, I am deliberately being vague about this because I do not want to talk smack about any individual organization, but even though to the outside world i you know was strong and all that stuff i still felt the effects of being pushed i felt the effects of being manipulated i felt the effects of being put in a very bad situation with no 
really good way to handle it because in in these moments you you have three essential choices you walk out you fight back or you don't fight and you give in those are the only options and there are no right or wrong answers to these things there's no good answer because other people would have handled it differently and i i can't really blame them because it's it's all about what consequences you can live with the thing about walking out is then they're just gonna find somebody else who are gonna do it i my name would not be attached to it the risk of continuing to do it is you know manipulator is going to manipulate and they could have done something else that was, you know, equally demeaning. And I would have been the one standing up there with my name and face on those proceedings. So it was a risk, but I felt like as long as I'm there, I can do something about it. If I walk out, then, you know, I, I cannot be there to protect and defend the people who you know they they were already the people involved were kind of shy to begin with and so the choice i made which was still not great was risk being painted as a bitch to do what's right and that that whole painted as a bitch fear of being a bitch is i think what's at the um core of uh, the workplace bullying statistics that I have here. Um, if you look, you've got male and female bullies. And there's a, you know, there's a large amount of female bullies in the workplace because workplace bullying is more about, um, about, manipulation and perception like I talked about and the thing about male bullies and female bullies they are both more likely to target women than men now the the gender gap is much larger with female bullies than male bullies I mean you've only got a uh you know a, a slight skew towards women with male workplace bullies uh with female bullies, there's, there's, there's no contest. It's practically two to one. And this is very interesting. Um, and, and it says down here in, in past uh, a Workplace Bullying Institute National Surveys, the woman-on-woman -woman bullying percentages were similarly high. You know, when a man is bullying a man, and you'll see here, they're, they're less likely to leave the situation male perpetrator female target very low female perpetrator male target very low now the thing is the number is consistent so that might mean the men still aren't leaving just fewer women bully men which is consistent with the overall numbers and female perpetrator female target again the been bullied and the currently bullied numbers this is actually higher than than before so that's very interesting same gender bullying people are less likely to leave and to me this goes back to what i thought of of people and i don't think it's a sexual harassment thing i think that sexual harassment is something very different um i think that the thing about sexual harassment is that there's an, you know, you're emboldened to leave um, more now because there's more awareness of the issue. I think that, and I know I get into this a lot, if you admit you've been bullied, you're seen as weak and that compromises you going forward. And I think that's a lot of the reason that men don't leave too. But I think that the reason f women are more likely to leave is if you stand up to the bully, then they're very likely to label you a bitch. And the minute you are labeled a bitch, you've lost. You have lost. Trust me. It's very hard. You have to decide whether you're going to embrace that and take the reputational knock 
that comes with it being okay to call you that or you spend your entire professional life combating that label. And that's the problem with the whole discussion around the word bitch. You know, people have reclaimed it. And I, I think that's... I think that's somewhat useful, the idea that the word becomes less scary, the idea that being a bad bitch is a good thing. I think that we do need to take some of the sting out of that word, because as much as I like it, the word is just too powerful to take it away from people. It is, it is this interesting combination uh, of socially acceptable and powerfully hurtful to throw the word bitch around. It does have a consequence. Because think about it, you know, a woman complains, oh, she's just being a bitch. A man expresses emotions. Oh, he's just a bitch. You know, it is a word that is really quite linked to social controls. There are many situations, especially in time-sensitive material, where, <sighs> You just can't be nice. I call this the nice game. And the nice game is something I, I designed to talk about how women bully other women, but increasingly it's, it's kind of a gender neutral term. The nice game is a form of, of social manipulation where the object of the game is to push your target into a place where they have to stop being nice. And that means that they are going to suffer consequences because they were put in a no-win situation and this drives me crazy it's it's highly manipulative and for a lot of supervisors it's very hard to spot because a lot of supervisors are overworked and they they, they just want to get the job done and they can't be concerned about being nice all the time but they just want it to stop so they tend to deal with outbursts instead of really looking at what the outburst, what led up to the outburst. Because a tricky thing about bullying, psychological bullying, is that the person who starts yelling, the person who loses it, and I'm not saying I yelled, this is just in general. Um, the person who gets really angry, for example, gamers, upset about being treated like a sure thing by its own, by their own you know, game manufacturers and, and press, they get treated like the aggressor. Oh, gamers are entitled. Gamers are harassers. All these things, right? When in fact, that's a reaction to being given lousy product and being, you know, demeaned and insulted by their own so-called enthusiast press for years and years and years. Gamers finally got... So, and, and a lot of gamers have been bullied in the past in, in other ways as well. And that's another uh, element of this that I don't think is talked about enough. That when people are perpetually bullied and it happens again and again and again, I don't find most people get better at dealing with it. I find they get more reactive at dealing with it and so they get run down. And that's what I've seen in the gaming community a lot that a lot of gamers are very gentle people. No, seriously, like behind the performance, behind the, the, the anon performance, the anonymous performance, that's all, I don't care, I don't, you know, I got a thick skin, I'm gonna use potty mouths, I'm gonna trash talk. Why are they anonymous? I've been told over and over and over again, this is the only way we're safe. This is the only way we can, we can speak freely. Anonymity protects us. So underneath that anonymity is a very different story. And so there's just this cycle of people making the choice, and it's actually a quite logical choice, of I can't stand up to these bullies because they're everywhere. They're in the game's press. They're in-game publishers. They're in-game developers. They have seen example after example after example of people with relative power shouting down their fan bases. And so instead of, 
you know, because they don't know how to fight back. They don't see a way to fight back. They adopt those personas through an anonymous anime avatar or Twitter egg or something like that. But that is a performance. When I talk about gender performance in, in Gamer's Guide to Feminism, performativity goes beyond that. These an, an anonymous online performance is a fascinating phenomenon. And this is what I think it is. They're emulating because this is what people have been told gets you ahead. And in some places it does. It has become very, very accepted. But the thing that's different between these CEOs and these media types and these, these you know, talking heads, these pundits who bully under their real name and for pay is that at least these anonymous people online know enough that it's wrong to not put their real name on it. They don't want people to associate that with their day-to-day -day lives. And that's very telling to me. And this has really opened my eyes up having this experience. Because you know what happens when you stand up to people and you fight back, which is what I've heard over and over and over again. People say they're doing with these, you know, brigades and these dog piles and all this stuff. They don't feel like they're, they're bullying. They feel like they're fighting back. But what they're not worried about at all, because it's not connected to the rest of their you know, their, their meat space lives is they're not getting labeled a bitch one way or another. So guys can talk about their feelings anonymously without being labeled a bitch. And women can be more aggressive than they're allowed to be in the real world and not be labeled a bitch. And I think this is something we really need to start looking at. I think that we need real leadership. Communities need leaders. They do. And I'm not, everybody, oh, but grassroots movements, all that stuff. Even grassroots movements have leaders. They have people that they rally around. Look at the whole feel the burn phenomenon. That I don't think Bernie Sanders created that. I think he tapped into that. But without him to rally around, that group wouldn't have been as effective as they were this election. Leadership matters. And recognizing the responsibilities within leadership matters too. And I think this is what's, what hasn't happened in gaming. Because more and more you start hearing, we have a responsibility to our shareholders. Or, well, we don't want to make anyone angry and have them not buy our game. And so these, these publishers... And these, and and I blame the developers less just because I know structurally the develop developers have much less control over things. They are told certain things or else kind of thing. So I I want to be clear. I'm blaming them less, but they're the the publishers and some developers, especially independent developers, and I think that's why we have more challenges in the independent space than in the AAA space on this point. They're, if not bullying their own consumers, they're allowing their own consumers to be bullied. They are abdicating their leadership position whenever it's convenient for a certain mythical portion of sales that they're afraid they're not going to get. And I think they're completely wrong. And my argument for this is The Witcher and Grand Theft Auto say you're wrong. There are a lot of people out there who are very offended by The Witcher franchise, who are very offended by the Grand Theft Auto franchise. And they complain and they complain and they complain and they try to use false consumer leverage to get these games to change. I will not buy your games. And Rockstar and CD Projekt go, well, fine, you're not buying our games anyway. And they keep doing what they're doing. And everybody clutches their pearls and acts all shocked and everything like that. But guess what? These games sell well. Because gamers can invest in something they can rely on. It is highly unlikely that CD Projekt Red and Rockstar are suddenly going to pivot 
to being, oh, we're all going to sing Kumbaya and start, you know, acting like the Outrage Warriors and all that stuff. They're a reliable brand. You know what you're getting. And that's the problem with some of these other brands that I think definitely have their problems but are despised. You know, the, the reason... The reason EA is the the brand that gamers and and gamers will say oh because they're corrupt and everything like that but there's smoke there's you know I I can't say EA is any worse than some other major publishers but they try to be big corporate I could be selling you know beans or bleach the same way I sell video games at the same time as they try to be a sports brand, at the same time as they try to be this social justice, we're going to stand up for gay people brand. And those brands are in conflict. Are you a hardcore company? Are you a, you know, so-called casual company? Are you a sports company? Are you a narrative-based social justice company? They're trying to be all of it. And I'm not saying that's not possible. And I'm not saying that a company shouldn't try to do a great many things. But it comes across as inauthentic. I don't know if it is. But it just seems like, well, we just are going to say anything to get your money. Right? Whereas a company like, you know, Ubisoft, for instance, they have a particular brand and that tends to be very much um, highly diverse social commentary. The the thing people joke about, about, yeah, Ubisoft games, or you can make any game you want as long as it's a, an open world game based on hubs, you know. And and that's not entirely fair because Ubisoft does have a sports brand. You know, they do, they've, they've done snowboarding games as long as I've been covering Ubisoft. And, you know, they, they dip their toe into soccer for a while too, or football as it's properly called. Um, and then, you know, then they take really interesting projects like South Park, the South Park, the Stick of Truth and St South Park, the Fractured But Whole. And they know it's kind of off their general brand. The publicists have told me like, yeah, that's really not on brand for us. But there's something so authentic about that because they, I, you really get the sense that it's like they just looked at this game and it had been, you know kind of toiling away with, with other publishers and, and other developers for a while. And they thought, no, you know what? This, this deserves to be made. This is, um, this is just a good product. And it needs a little help, but this is a game that deserves to be made. And it just comes across as more authentic. It comes across as more trustworthy. And people love to complain about Ubisoft, but... They like to complain that Ubisoft is buggy as opposed to that Ubisoft is hated. And that's a real difference. And I think the reason for that is because gamers desperately want something they can believe in. And this is why leadership is important. And this is why the lack of leadership in gaming has led to the current community crisis. People want to believe that they can be treated fairly. People want to believe that they are going to get a fair shake and be judged based on their merits. And that can't happen in a culture of rampant bullying and manipulation that is blaming the wrong targets. Gamers are not the root of the bully culture in the video game industry. The... the tone of various op-eds has been unduly aggressive. It has unduly attacked the very people they're supposed to be speaking to. And publishers, in their desperation to have very, you know, expensive games, increasingly expensive games be profitable, have been using the current player base as cash cows because they just don't know 
they are not as good at attracting new players as they are at attracting at, at getting more money out of existing players and again i go back to cd project and rockstar games who create games that have a vast amount of content for a single price you don't have to pay any more to get the complete experience in The Witcher or Grand Theft Auto. You know, there is a huge amount of game, hours and hours and hours. You know, the a lot of Bethesda games are the same way. Fallout and the Elder Scrolls games, they're, they're massive games. You get a lot of quantitative value for money. And I don't say qualitative because I think that... Uh, out of those three, I'd say The Witcher 3 probably had the best story, the best consistent story, interactive story, that that playing told a story. Assassin's Creed is pretty good that way before. Fallout is not good at all, and, and Skyrim is not good at all. Those games are just collapsing under their hugeness. Um, and this is, this is something as analysts instead of focusing on the behavior of gamers and talking about, oh, the depiction of women and the depiction of gay people and the depiction of trans people and people of color and, oh, the depiction of aliens who may represent these sorts and it's all problematic and it's all privilege and agency and all these things. We're not actually looking at the structure of these games and pointing out, hey, look, do you notice a do you notice a correlation between games that say we are what we are, screw you if you're offended, and value for money, and games that oh oh we want to be so socially progressive and we want to care what people think and we're going to twist ourselves into pretzels trying to appeal to the outrage class and then we have to do a ton of in-app purchases because our games aren't selling enough copies to break even do you see a correlation here do you see a correlation between people who are pandering to these bases who are not heavy consumers of games for the most part, they complain frequently about games they have not played. And in this point, I'm not talking about the press. At least the press play these games. You know who I'm talking about. The people who are like, oh, I don't play AAA games. I play indie games because they speak to me more. These are the people I'm talking about. They'll complain about Assassin's Creed and never play it. And they'll complain about um, a game like The Witcher. Or, you know, a game like Bloodborne or something like that. And I think Bloodborne didn't get more complaints because not enough... You usually have the one person who's played it and then goes to their subreddit and outrages! Oh, there's this moment! And everyone else just picks up on the outrage without playing the game because guess what? The game's too hard for them. And a lot of these games don't have difficulty settings anymore, so they can't put them on easy, Right? The, the reason certain popular franchises get complained about is they're easy enough to play. Whereas others, people can't outrage over because they don't know it's there. They're, they are not willing to play hard, lengthy games. Wow, that sounded really rude. But there is definitely a bully dynamic going on in gaming that is hurting it on a foundational economic level. And this is the sort of thing that concerns me greatly. And this is why I have to take deep breaths at the beginning and ending of talking about this. Because it just brought home again that the, the firmly held belief I have that we have been blaming the wrong people. We have been blaming the wrong source for gaming's current community woes. You can't blame the rank and file when the leaders aren't doing their jobs. It is always, ultimately, the boss's responsibility. This is why we're talking about John Podesta's emails in the context of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. It is her campaign. She bears an element of responsibility for the behavior of her staff. The gaming industry is the same way it is ludicrous 
that the game companies and the game media is complaining about game consumers. Leaders lead. Don't act like leaders. Don't collect the salaries of leaders and then blame people who are rank and file consumers for your choices, for your bad attitude, for your negativity, for your inability to stand up and talk about the positives and defend the hobby you claim to love despite its flaws. And this is why I say nobody's perfect. Nobody agrees 100%. Get off the focus on flaws because this is choking the life out of gaming. It is really easy to focus on one or two or three fairly major things that we do have to address. And notice I didn't say fix, I said address. We have to address some of these social and community issues. We do. Why? Because it's a massive PR problem. But saying that does not mean that I don't believe that gaming is the best entertainment medium in the world. That doesn't mean that I don't think that on balance, the quality, the consistent quality of gaming project, pr products, big gaming projects, AAA, our equivalent of blockbusters, are consistently of better and deeper quality than comparable Hollywood blockbuster films. Could you imagine if a game was as bad as that piece of garbage Ghostbusters movie? Could you imagine if it just took a format and tried to just totally change it and put the name on it? Companies have tried and they have been punished. Like gamers demand better and that is good. You know, we are part of an emerging, it, it's tough because it's like artist games, artist, you know, games are art, games are game. They're both. And that's what's amazing. Every time you play a video game, you're part of a conversation. And it's not necessarily a conversation between you and another person. It's a conversation between you and a game, right? You are a part of it, an integral part of it. And this is amazing. It's amazing from an artistic perspective. It's amazing from an intellectual perspective. It's amazing from a fun perspective. And I wish there were more, uh, there were more columns talking about these truly amazing elements of video games. But then we hear, oh, nobody wants to hear about that. People don't want to read these things. The, the clickbait headlines sell. That's why we do them because readers have been trained to react to those things they do not trust that a positive article will actually make them feel good about their hobby people want to feel good but we've trained people to react to negativity we've trained people to react to outrage and yeah it's gonna be really hard to to reconfigure those sensitivities but for the health of the damn industry, we have to do it. We have to find a happy medium between being negative about everything, just crapping all over everything because people think that's authentic and only praising things for pay. It, th there's no in between anymore. There isn't. Because why? Part of it is because if YouTubers take money to cover a game, they're not allowed to criticize it. I think that's got to end. I think that's got to end. I think you pay a YouTuber because you realize there is benefit to them being involved, period. They have enough audience. Because to me, I think there is more benefit to allowing them to say, and I say them, not because I don't do the content, because I don't get paid to do this sort of content. But I think there is more, there, you are more likely to sell a game when criticisms are involved in it. Because then the consumers know that person was allowed to criticize the game. So you are getting their honest opinion, not what they were allowed to say based on a non-disclosure agreement. They don't get, they not just do you not get paid. If you criticize the game, you lose your access according to those contracts and they can sue you. This is, this isn't effective marketing. It's not honest. It's coercion. It's collusion 
to an extent because people are saying, yeah, yeah, I'll sell my soul for $300 or whatever it costs. It's not a ton of money. That's why you do it over and over and over again. But this has got to stop. You know, f people need to start looking at the long-term health of the industry and beyond a couple of bad headlines. If your game is buggy in a demo, for instance, allow us to say that so that you can say, we know it's a demo, we'll fix it, and then actually do it. Like, these are things that have to be done. These are things that have to be done. Why? Because the trust is not there anymore. So take the shackles off the YouTubers, focus on the YouTubers who are positive. You know, there are certain, there are a few people who people go, oh, well, it's better if he talks about our game, even though he's going to dump all over it. There are those people because they have a large enough audience. But guess what? That means that other YouTubers are not allowed to build that audience because people can't trust their authenticity. Like, stop doing that. Stop doing that. It's bad for business. And it's just, it's not right. And I know people start rolling their eyes and stopping caring about whether something's right or wrong. When did that stop mattering? Like, when did the simple fact that something is just not moral Something is just not ethical. When did that stop mattering? That drives me crazy. You know, I, I, I get yelled at every day by commenters because I won't pull punches. You guys, I'm saying what I mean. And people start screaming at me. I don't stop expressing my opinions and I don't always stop expressing. Sometimes I stop because like, it's just not worth that I don't care enough about this topic. But on stuff I think is important, I will not allow myself to be shouted down. Because I can't come on here and talk about what other people should be doing. That other people should stand up to bullies and other people should behave ethically if I'm not. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people are missing. That you can't tell other people to behave to a standard that is inconsistent with your own behavior. It's just that simple. That's common sense. And I'll leave it there. But hopefully you enjoyed that that little rant. I, I am exhausted, guys. I This is going to be a tough week because I'm starting the week tired. So fair warning now. Thank God there's some pre-tape stuff that I can rely on because I am just, I feel crappy. I feel beat up. And it's not because I was harmed. It's not because, and it's the, it's the worry of, oh man, how is this manipulative person going to twist what I did to take blame off of them and label me the problem. It happens again and again and again and again. And um, that's something to address at a later date because this is already pretty long. Uh, I was going to show you kittens today, but I'll leave that because this video is too long. Let's just close off. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out.